good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. And a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us. I'm Ruth Douglas, Deputy Editor for News at SciDev.net. And it's my pleasure to be moderating this high level panel discussion on food security and the pandemic on behalf of CABI and SciDev. The impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic have been felt the world over. Lengthy periods of lockdown and restrictions on movement have affected the economies and health systems of every country and the lives and livelihoods of millions of people. But the impacts on food security have been seen most starkly in the global south, where heightened restrictions and disrupted economic activities have led to increasing poverty and hunger, especially among the most vulnerable groups, including children. According to the 2020 UN report on the state of food security and nutrition in the world, global food insecurity increased more in 2020 than in the previous five years put together, with much of the rise in hunger likely linked to COVID-19. Up to 811 million people were undernourished, almost a tenth of the world's population. And the World Food Programme estimates that in the countries where it operates, some 272 million people are at risk of becoming acutely food insecure due to the effects of the COVID-19 crisis. However, two years into the pandemic, there are clear lessons to be learned, including on the weaknesses in the food supply chain and social protection in the global south. Today, we will consider how these lessons can be harnessed to provide quick recovery plans and better crisis responses. Our high level expert panelists will look at how we can attain food security, strengthen resilience and improve preparedness in the event of future global shocks. To this end, I'm delighted to welcome today Professor Afikeno Jerome, Special Advisor to the Commissioner for Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy and Sustainable Development at the African Union Commission. <coughs> Um, and Professor Schengen Fan, Chair, Professor and Dean at the Academy of Global Food Economics and Policy at China's Agricultural University. Dr. Tariq Khan, Advisor and Director General of the Ministry of, of uh, National, uh, excuse me, National Food Security and Research in Pakistan. Moses Mwali, Director of the Department of Agriculture in Zambia and Nia Wilshire, Global Director for Value Chains and Trade at CABI. In a moment, I will be inviting each of our panelists to give a short presentation, during which time, please feel free to submit a question in the, in the Q&A function. I'll then put as many of these as I can to our panelists in the second half of this event. For now, let me hand over to Dr. Daniel Elger, who joined CABI as Chief Executive last year at the height of the pandemic, and he will give his opening remarks. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Ruth. And I'd just like to offer a, a warm welcome on behalf of CABI and SciDevNet to our panelists and to all our viewers and listeners around the world to what I'm sure will be a value, valuable and uh, illuminating discussion today. So this event is part of CABI's work with our 49 member countries to support them in their work to navigate through the COVID-19 pandemic and as they seek to build back better in its aftermath. I think it's very fitting that the event is organized and convened today by SciDevNet, which is a part of CABI, but editorially independent from it, and which is a world leading source of news, views and analysis about science and technology for global development. And the SciDev team has done an important job of covering many aspects of the pandemic and the response to it across the global south, including, of course, in the vital area of food systems and food security that we're focusing on today. As everyone we're watching will know, the world already faced a big challenge in feeding a population that will reach 10 billion by 2050 and in managing the complex challenges that some of our speakers will touch on today, not only of avoiding undernutrition, but also preventing the hidden hunger of micronutrient deficiencies and the growing worldwide problem of obesity and its consequences. So COVID-19, by disrupting food supply chains, has both highlighted and exacerbated existing weaknesses in global food systems, 
with estimates like those that Ruth referred to, suggesting very big increases in the number of people facing food insecurity today and in the numbers at risk of becoming acutely food insecure. The pandemic has provided a really stark indicator of the need for more resilient food systems with fundamental change needed if we're going to build sustainable systems that can help to address the link challenges of feeding a growing population, supporting growth and jobs, and protecting our planet from climate change and environmental degradation. This is a theme that's been talked about very extensively this year, including at the UN Food Systems Summit, and the COP26 meeting. And the challenge now is to translate this into uh, action on the ground. CABI's own work worldwide with smallholder farmers aims to increase their resilience to threats to their food security and livelihoods. Understanding how different threats like pests and diseases and climate change interact to impact people's crops and how we can tackle these threats in ways that make the food system as a whole more ready for and resilient to shocks and to reduce the vulnerability of the people who depend on it, particularly the poorest and most marginalized people. During the pandemic, we've learned important lessons about how to keep working with rural communities in the face of huge disruption. For example, we've really seen the value of technology and remote communications approaches as means to offer advisory services to farmers when movement and assembly of people are restricted. At the same time, I think we've become more aware of the risk of exacerbating existing inequalities when access to such technologies is, is uneven. At CABI, we're shortly going to be engaging with our member countries in a regional consultation process, which we, we run every three years. And from that, we expect to gain important new data and insights that will really help us play our part in addressing the challenges of food system transformation. In the next phase of our work, we'll be continuing to apply our expertise across climate smart approaches to managing crop pests and diseases, including management of devastating invasive species like the desert locust and the fall army worm. We'll be supporting various approaches to the building of more sustainable food value chains, and we'll be continuing to share high quality information and knowledge with uh, farmers and other stakeholders. And we'll be working alongside many partners uh, in that endeavor. So I think while the COVID-19 pandemic has been and remains a calamity of epic proportions, it's vital that we don't miss the lessons from it that can be harnessed to achieve positive change and help us manage even bigger shocks like climate change as they come along. That means listening attentively to many diverse perspectives as the world seeks to move forward. And with that thought in mind, I hand the floor back to Ruth to introduce our distinguished panelists. Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, unfortunately, uh, one of our panelists who we had um, who we had on our list originally has, is unable to make it today. That's Her Excellency Josepha Leonor Correa Sacco, the African Union Commissioner for Rural Economy and Agriculture. However, I'm delighted to welcome in her place um, Professor Afikena. Uh, Jerome, Special Advisor to the Commission for Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy and Sustainable Development at the African Union Commission in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So thank you so much for joining us, Pro Professor Jerome, um, at short notice. Um, Professor Jerome is also a consultant for the Food and Agriculture Organisation on, on Policy and a visiting professor of economics at Ikbinadion University in Okada, Nigeria. He has over two decades experience working on policy issues in Africa and has had sev held, held several distinguished positions, including visitor, visiting scholar international, um, at the International Monetary Fund, visiting fellow at the World Bank and senior associate member at St. Anthony's College, Oxford University. So welcome, Professor Jerome. Um, I understand you're going to be talking to us today about how we can design sustainable food systems that will weather the risks posed by climate change. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. 
Ambassador Joseph Asako very much wanted to be part of this meeting, but she has a conflicting uh, appointment with the president of uh, Namibia currently. Hence, she requested me to step in at very short term notice as a special advisor. Uh, luckily, she has made the, her presentation was ready. So what I will just do is to make our presentation. Um, Daniel Elgar, esteemed uh, panelists, many of whom I'm lucky, I'm happy to see again. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Kabi and our science vet for this very stimulating and uh, interesting topic, this webinar that they're organizing today. It is very, very topical and very relevant. Uh, invariably, what I plan to do is just to share some few slides. The first uh, logical starting point is to look at the global food emergency due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. As uh, we heard from uh, Daniel Elgar, a uh, few minutes ago, the food supply is being threatened by climate change and water scarcity. Even as populations continue to increase, especially in the developing world. Take the case of uh, Africa. It is projected that the population will double to 2.4 billion people by 2050. And this is putting a lot of challenges on everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic has made the situation worse as control measures put in place to contain the spread of the virus disrupted the uh, food and agricultural uh, systems around the world, revealing the fragilities uh, existing in the uh, system. Uh, take the case of Africa again. Uh, studies are beginning to emerge on the part of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, a new study uh, re released by Bloomberg just last week indicated that as many as 30 million people have been pushed into poverty as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. It has already set us back in that we are losing all the gains that we have made in the past uh, five years. Uh, at the same time, the pandemic has increased the needs of households for clean water. Uh, that is, uh, if you look at the non-pharmaceutical protocols, COVID protocols, what is needed is washing of hands as well as uh, sanitation. But well, we had a lot of challenges in Africa uh, because uh, we have an inadequate uh, supply of these uh, facilities. So looking at the supply chains, uh, by and large, you find that uh, suppliers have been caught off guard with logistic nightmares throughout the world. The final point I want to make there is that uh, what we found is that economies, which relies heavily on food imports, are highly vulnerable. And this applies to majority of uh, African countries. Because if you look at the Sosahara food import bill, uh, it's currently, uh, it was uh, 43 billion in 2019. And it's projected that this may ri rise to 110 billion by 2025. Unfortunately, because of the breakdown in supply uh, logistics, it was a nightmare for very many of these uh, uh, economies as a result of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, let us quickly take a look who exactly is at risk from this uh, pandemic. The first point is that uh, typically the most uh, vulnerable were people who were at risk as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I will quickly atomize them. The first group were the people with limited or irregular income. Uh, majority of them who operate in the informal sector. Uh, the third category where the people in poor health, especially malnutrition, I mean, people suffering from uh, chronic uh, disease and compromised immune systems, which is why in the process of uh, uh, vaccination, I mean, they normally put at a uh, high priority. 
Another group is uh, people living with a stigma. I mean, this includes uh, the HIV positive people, prisoners and their families, the mentally ill and the disabled. The isolated too, especially people living in uh, remote uh, locations or having no social network, we're clearly at risk. So also we are the homeless or internally displaced uh, people. The final category is uh, the vulnerable, including elder, the elderly, orphans, and uh, vulnerable children. Uh, it is quite important that we look at this category because when we want to build back uh, better, these are the category we will try to uh, assist. Additional group, uh, we are those who rely on markets for the majority of food purchases. So also we are those employed in occupations that may be severely impacted, especially tourism, restaurants, and taxi drivers. I mean, countries like Kenya are still trying to recover from the pandemic because of the impact of uh, 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 this uh, group. So also we can look at the group of uh, uh, caretakers. So a logical issue then is how then do we achieve food security moving forward? I will quickly atomize some uh, few points. The first one is that unless immediate action is taken, it is increasingly clear that there is an impending global food emergency uh, that could have long-term impact on hundreds of millions of children and adults. That invariably is the statement of the U.S. Secretary General Antony Guterres. So what we've done in Africa is to answer the big question, how to achieve climate-friendly recovery for COVID-19 and food security. So what we've done is uh, working with the uh, African ministers of uh, environment. The African Union have been able to uh, put up a green recovery action plan that we enable us to build back uh, better. Uh, this green recovery action plan has uh, five major pillars, and one of them is uh, climate smart uh, agriculture. Uh, this uh, plan was put in place with the assistance of the UK government in the lead to COP26, uh, which was just ended. Another important point is that we should not forget that food systems contribute up to 29% of the greenhouse gas emissions, including 45, uh, 44% of uh, maintained, thus having a negative impact of uh, biodiversity. So what we've done as part of mitigating this is a part of the UN World Food Systems. Uh, Africa developed a common African position for the UN Food System uh, Summit. And this common African position has 43 game-changing solutions along the five action tracks of the UN uh, Food uh, Systems uh, to try and build back uh, better, uh, noting that Africa is defined by vulnerable and overlapping shocks, uh, if you look at uh, the full system of uh, Africa. So uh, because of uh, time, let me just quickly move to the, the, my last uh, concluding slides. Among the solutions, some of them which we already proposed in the uh, common position for the food action track is uh, there's need for farm adaptation that uses uh, cropping systems, which improves the heat, uses water sustainably and efficient. Another solution is the need to adopt uh, flexible, sustainable designs and smart approaches like adjustment of planting and harvesting dates, use of better cultivars and uh, so forth. Uh, we also think that as part of uh, mitigating the challenge of broken supply chain, is uh, boosting intra-African uh, uh, trade. This is quite important because uh, Africa has just put up uh, an African Continental Free Trade Agreement that commends trading on the uh, 1st of uh, January uh, 2021, this year. So we're trying to see how we can use it to boost food imports in the uh, continent. I also think that uh, research innovation uh, and the increasing use of technology will be part of uh, the solutions 
in moving forward and building back better. So also will be efficient and green transport infrastructure, improve data gathering availability and uh, accessibility. And uh, my final point is the big elephant in the room, which is uh, the need for us to change our diets uh, as a result of uh, increasing demands. So who then are those stockholders which we should target in trying to build back better? I'll just uh, highlight some of the key stakeholder groups. The first one is agricultural producers and processors. The second is uh, the private sector will be very, very key to many of the policies and programs we are putting in place. So also will be farmers association. Uh, we also need to bring on board the national emergency management agencies, the public work and water agencies, uh, the transportation uh, companies of uh, associations. Uh, I also think uh, the health centers and hospitals uh, will be important. And the, the final group of actors will be public security agencies. Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, let me stop here for now. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Jerome. Thank you so much for those uh, interesting thoughts and a great start to our discussion. And so next, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Schengen Fan, Chair, Professor and Dean at the Academy of Global Food Economics and Policy, at China's Agricultural University and a member of the United Nations Lead Group for the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement. Prior to this, Professor Fan served as Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute from 2009 to 2019 and as a member, Vice Chair and Chair of the Food and Nutrition Council of the World Economic Forum. Today, he will be speaking about how sound policy measures and strengthened institutional linkages can help mitigate the negative impact of the pandemic on food security. Welcome, Professor Fan, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ruth. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. you can see me, you can hear me. Great. So I changed the title slightly because many other speakers probably will speak the same issues. I want to zoom in. How can we prevent a further food price hike right now? So I will, I'm going to speak three issues. The one is the recent food price hike, the second causes of recent food price hike, and finding the policy measures and action which are very much related to, to the assignment that you gave to me. So I want to show you for the last uh, year and a half, the world food prices have risen. Compared to last October, the food price has risen by more than 30%. Um, so is this going to be a continued trend or is this just a short-term hike? Now, there are many reasons for, for the recent food price increase. The one is obviously oil price has, has, increased, has increased quite a bit. The second obviously, is the COVID-19. You know, COVID-19 disrupted supply chain, disrupted the transportation and, and beyond. I think uh, Professor Jerome has already mentioned and Daniel have already discussed about this. So, and, but there are many other factors, the climate change, the conflict, the macroeconomic issues, the emerging diseases, and, and the poor governance as amplifier. So I call it the perfect storm. I analyzed the, uh, the food crisis uh, for 2007, 2008. So there were many reasons, many causes of that food price hike. And today we have seen some seminar that phenomena or some of the or similar challenges. For example, we have seen higher oil price. We have seen relaxing monetary policy from European Union, from US, from probably even more countries, conflict, climate change, and obviously COVID-19. Now the poor governance. So if we don't do well at a global level, national level, if we don't coordinate with each other, poor governance can easily amplify the situation. So I would call it perfect storm. So when all these things happen together, it's a coincidence of risk and a threat that can disrupt the whole global food system very badly. And it can, it can cause the collapse of the food system. So what should we do? I think in short run, obviously, we must ensure that um, the food supply 
of the green channels introduced by many countries here initially in China, and then many Southeast Asian countries to make sure that food will be transported freely without blockage. Food and medicine are the top priorities that can be transported. Obviously, the, the workers, the drivers have to be protected. And secondly, is, is to res restrain food export bans. We know that starting from last April, many countries, including Russia, Vietnam, India, uh, and also Central Asian countries, begin to use export bans to secure their domestic food, uh, food supply. That's bad policy. That will further exacerbate global food price hikes. And obviously provide a social protection for vulnerable people. You know, it is poor people such as children, women, and elderly who will suffer more from a food price hike. And offer temporary support, special support to SMEs, smallholders, and small traders. Because this guy, small guys, small, small um, it's enterprises, smallholders play a huge role in linking production to consumption in many, many developing countries in the South. Now, in, in the long run, obviously, we needed to move to other forms of green energy to address the risk of oil price shocks. Right now, oil price is increasing. I mean, we must do better to use renewable energy to make sure that the global food price, uh, oil price, will not continue to rise. And to stabilize macroeconomic policies, such as and build buffers between macroeconomic policy stability and food systems, for example, by introducing taxation of investment in rural infrastructure and agriculture R&D. So whenever there's macro shops, then uh, there are huge impacts on food economy, such as uh, let's say exchange rates, such as uh, relaxing on monetary policy and beyond. So we need to have a buffer before that. And then ensure access to nutritious foods for all to stabilize rural communities in regions of conflict. So yeah, I wanted to, to focus on conflict regions, Afghanistan, part of Pakistan, now Myanmar in Asia, and in many Asian countries, even in Northern Nigeria. Um, I, I think we must make sure that uh, the people have access to nutritious and healthy foods in the countries, in the conflict countries and employ nutrition technology such as biodification, fortification, to help address the, the vicious cycles of conflict, climate change, poverty, and food insecurity, and enhance resilience of food system with climate adaptation measures in countries in conflict. I think both Daniel and Professor Jerome have mentioned that. And strengthen the governance capacity of countries in conflict. So focus on conflict countries. Now, in long run, we must also invest, continue to invest in rural infrastructure, irrigation, and drainage to make our food system resilient in the long term, and scale up productive and regenerative agriculture. So this sort of high input, high output model in the past is not sustainable. So we must promote more sustainable, productive, and regenerative agriculture, and re redirect the subsidy policies to climate-friendly, impactful public investments. You know, we are spending $700 billion globally in subsidizing water fertilizers to promote, to produce stable grains. So these subsidies are not sustainable. They, put, they do not produce healthy and nutrition, nutritional foods. Let's repurpose them. And promote multiple wins, as well as emerging technologies, including yield enhancing, conservation technologies, and nutrition. You know, I think. Um, the multiple win, wins in yield, wins in nutrition, wins in climate adaptation, and maybe even more. And uh, you know, improve the resilience of the, the food supply chain. So not just production side, the whole uh, the chain. And use the One Health approach, uh, plant, plant health, environmental health, and human health. All this health are uh, hand in hand. They must be better coordinated, particularly controlling uh, the, the zoonotic diseases. We know that COVID-19 came from zoonotic diseases. Now, I wanted to emphasize the role of knowledge. I think Kaby has done a great job. We need a similar, similar 
the platform like IPCC for, for, for climate change. We need to have one for food system. We use our data knowledge uh, and to empower the citizens, empower the actors to really take quick actions. So let's all work together to set up that mechanism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Fan. And um, next, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Tariq Khan, who is Advisor and Director General of the Ministry of National Food Security and Research in Pakistan. With a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University, Dr. Khan is a career civil servant with more than 30 years experience in areas including public administration, local government and rural development and public finance. He has previously led projects at the United Nations Development Programme dealing with livelihoods, poverty reduction and integrated rural development and disaster management. Today he will be sharing his insights on agricultural innovations and research. Good to have you with us, Dr. Khan. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Ruth uh, Douglas and, and all, the, all the learned panelists. Uh, before developing my, uh, my, my narrative on this, on this important topic, uh, I want to give you some ideas about, uh, about uh, the, uh, the food security uh, situation in our country and what happened uh, during the, uh, the, the, the pandemic and still we are, we are struggling with this, uh, with this serious issue. Um, this will be, uh, Madam, this will be the, the sequence of my presentation. I'll, I'll be giving you just some, some ideas about the Pakistan agriculture, the vulnerability, the, the economy, especially the agroeconomy, then the, then the department where I'm, I'm working at the moment and the, the efforts of the Ministry of National Food Security and Research. Again, again, during the same period, we had two serious issues, the sugar crisis in Pakistan, the wheat crisis in Pakistan, these were also, and the, and the situation was very much uh, aggravated uh, because of, the, because of the, uh, the, the COVID situation. And again, uh, Madam, you might be aware about that uh, the the year 2019 and 2020 was a was a was a serious uh, year in terms of the locust emergency in the in the whole region. The uh, the the country was uh, was struggling with the with, with managing desert locust. But on the other hand, we we had the, we had the, the locust issues like even the even the the coordination, the management, the surveillance issues. Those all were, were affected by that by that, that by that uh, pandemic. At the end, I'll, 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 be, I'll be just just coming towards the crisis management. How do we manage that uh, that that situation? And later on, later on, uh, a lease project, locust emergency and food security project. This is a kind of a lessons learned during during the last two years, uh, and uh, we identified our our, our weak areas. And and, uh, and 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 we've planned for the for the future. So so I'll I'll, I'll be I'll be discussing about that. If we look at the uh, if we look at the, the the Pakistan, Pakistan is comprising of nine agroecological zones. We have been producing all, almost everything, and the and the economy is is largely largely agro based. Uh, even even our our industries, all the the the, the raw material is provided by the by the by the agriculture uh, um, the livelihood uh, the uh, um, the the dependence of the of, of the population particularly the 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 the, the rural population is, is totally dependent on the on the agriculture if you look at the the history of the the the, the country the country has, has faced many many serious uh, uh, threats in the form of the floods in 2010 we and in 2011, we had serious floods. Although we have a, we have the largest uh, irrigation system of the world, but we don't don't have enough enough capacities to 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 store that that water if it is access. On the same side, on the same side, we we saw some some eras of, of the of the droughts, and even even uh, even that that was a serious issue. In the in the in the second uh, uh, the the first question in the in the in the second row. That is about the the locust situation. Locust, as I already I mentioned, that uh, which was again a serious issue. Some 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 agricultural practices 
which are also contributing in the uh, in the in, in, in damaging our, our climate like uh, like you know, know that the the rice production the the excessive use of water we don't have have, have that much that that much sophisticated technologies which which may manage which which may uh, uh, economize our, our water use and again again you know that uh, the um, the uh, the uh, the puddling effect in the in the in the rice that has been contributing in in in, in uh, creation of the of the methane in the uh, and uh, and damaging the the environment so these are these are cert certain issues and i'm just just giving you a quick quick ideas um, the, these are these are the vulnerabilities, and the pandemic has has made the situation more 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 challenging for us. This slide is 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 just just telling us about the 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 role of the DPP, uh, the, the sorry the, the the contribution of the agriculture sector. Twenty two percent of the of the GDP is is comprising of the of the of the agriculture sector. 70% of all the all the foreign exchange is approximately earned through, 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 through this imported sector. So any 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 kind kind of damage or, or any kind of mismanagement may cause may cause a serious serious threat to, to, to our, our, our agroeconomy. If we look at the, the, the pandemic, pandemic has, has almost affected all, all, all sectors of the society even the transportation even the, even the labor even even the this, uh, the SMEs in our country the the common person was 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 badly affected by the by that by that pandemic just i'm, I'm giving you an idea of, of the, the department of plant protection the ministry of national food security and research the the, uh, the the assignments are given to us are the plant quarantine the pesticide registration and the and the, and the locust Everywhere, whenever any any agro commodity enter or, or or go out of this country, you need you need import permits, you need phytosanitary regulations, the plant health certificates, and things like that. This area was was very much was was disturbed by the by the pandemic by the pandemic, or uh, as I have already mentioned that uh, that the imports and exports were were badly affected by that. But despite those those realities, the department has has managed those. Pesticide registration is another another important area where where pesticides are are the, are the important inputs. Unfortunately, in in, in, in Pakistan, we, we 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 are just formulating and re, repackaging the, the the pesticides. The active ingredient is is imported here. When the when the imports were 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 affected. At that time, at that time, the availability of pesticide at the right time that was a, that was a challenge during the epidemic. Locust control, as I have already mentioned, that uh, that was uh, that that that, that remained an issue. If you look at the at the at the at the, at the country, or a, a, around thirty eight percent of the of the uh, the the country area is is a recession area for the for the desert locust breeding, and. Uh, Unfortunately, Pakistan is uh, counted among among those four countries which has two breeding seasons. One is the one is the winter spring breeding season, which occurs in, in Balochistan. I have mentioned it here in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the pink in the pink color, and the other one is the summer monsoon breeding season. So, and in between that uh, that that those two breeding seasons, we uh, our main production area, which is called as the Indus Valley, is is. Uh, is 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 lying lying in, in in amid these these two breeding seasons. Whenever whenever there there, there is a migration of the locusts from 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 one breeding season to a, a region to another, automatically automatically are our main crops, which are the lifelines of our, our our economy, are the cotton, are the paddy, and the wheat. Those 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 are all all were 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 were, were serious victim of uh, that uh, that that situation. With the support of uh, the uh, FAO, with the support of the regional countries, we have managed that that situation. These are these are certain certain uh, uh, statistics, uh, like like wheat producing in in our country. That is that is the the total total area. The production is uh, is that is is that much. If if there is if there is a fifteen percent losses to to the to the wheat to the wheat. So, so a, a calculation has, has already made by, by 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 our ministry that 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 much will be the will be the losses to the, to the economy, and that 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 would be would, would be in billions. 
so such such mismanagement is not only only because of the because of the climatic factors if if the pandemic if the if the labor unavailability if if, if transportation issues if un unavailability of the uh, of, of of the input inputs are, are timely not available so such kind of uh, such kind of issues can be can be raised in in our our country and 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 we will be we would be confronted to 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 serious serious uh, uh, serious food security situation pandemic pandemic i think i think itself is it's a vice versa if we have a we have a food secure system in our, our country we will be we will be in a, in, a, in a better position to 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 cope with the with the with the with the pandemics vice versa and again again if 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 the if the pandemic is is not managed that will be that will be that will be having having a, a serious detrimental effect on the on the agri economy these are sir, i don't want to go into into details of of the, these figures there there are two types of uh, seasons in our country the, the 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 rabi season and then the and the kharif season the, these these are some some of some of the calculation which we have made 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 during during the pandemic situation just to just to just to just just to have the 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 basic information for 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 devising policies and and and, and management actions onion tomatoes uh, oil seed crops sugar cane rice maize uh, these are these are these the, the statistics about that again during the same period when the in fact the uh, the the covid situation was uh, was uh, was uh, was reached to 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 a serious uh, level during during uh, march 20 uh, 2020 and 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 in the april may and june we had the sugar sugar crisis although although we have we have enough enough sugar sugar mills but but because of the because of the mismanagement because of the the the, the climatic factors the the sugar availability become a become a serious issue at that time at them look at the look at the people uh, standing in in coos they were uh, uh, struggling for for getting sugar so this was one, one of the issue another issue was was the wheat crisis you know that in 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 in, in the end of our subcontinent to wheat is one of the ma major major staple food because because of the mismanagement because of the because of the other 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 so many so many issues we 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 were confronted with the with the with the wheat crisis and pakistan was as at at a plan to to import wheat and the wheat was was started in the in the august 2020 so so the so the supply of wheat from 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 the karachi port to the to the entire country the transportation the availability of the of the containers availability of uh, Of 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 the of the infrastructure, it was again again a big 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 challenge. Challenge on on one side on one side there were there were lockdowns uh, there there were there were restrictions, uh, but on the other end we were we 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 were struggling with 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 our our our, our basic basic issues like like provision of the 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 staple food to 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 our masses. So so this was this this was one of one of the one of the serious challenge. This uh, the. this slide show show the show the uh, covid complications like like we had uh, we had the uh, the lockdowns the movements were were restricted availability of labor was a, was a problem look at look at the situation in the hospitals the the, the testing the the transport uh, traveling traveling was was very much very much affected by that even even the inside inside for for a, for a brief period of time even even the local movement was was restricted in the in the in the country which was which has which has uh, aggravated the the, uh, the the situation more more for us now i'm i'm coming coming towards uh, the, the the crisis management how did we do as i have already already mentioned that in march 2019 uh, we we the uh, the the desert locust uh, uh, entered in the, in the in the country then 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 uh, uh, the initially initially uh, some damages were were, were occurred to the to the uh, to to our or 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 areas in balochistan especially those areas which are which are which are already already vulnerable 
then the national election plan was 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 in, in, uh, evolved in, in December 2019. The, the 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 NAP was submitted to the prime minister and got 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 that 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 that, that approved. And emergency was invoked at that time. Here, uh, let me let me to 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 clarify. Here, the, the emergency means just to just to just to relax some of the government regulations regarding the 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 procurements regarding otherwise otherwise there there there, there are longer procedures of the PEPRA Pakistan. Uh, uh, Pakistan uh, uh, PEPRA rules, which are which are which are very much complicated, but 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 we have managed that that situation. Even even the Pakistani forces were involved in that. Uh, the uh, the general headquarters, the military operation directorates, the NAP was revo revised time to time. Here, this this revision was 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 made in light of the pandemic. Initially, the NAP was 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 developed in 2019, but but that was revised. Even the even 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 some of some of the issues related to to the pandemics were included in that, and a, a, a collective forum with the name of NCOC National National Command and, and Control System was 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 developed, wherein all the all the all the uh, all the interministerial division uh, decisions were were made on 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 a daily basis uh, to to manage the COVID situation. The National Locus Control Center was established, and finally. A locust emergency and food security project was uh, was established. I just just want to give uh, you the, some salient features of uh, that project. That project is is, is comprising of uh, uh, two uh, two hundred uh, million US dollars. That is a, that is a, a, a soft loan from the from the World Bank. The uh, Economic uh, Executive Council of the National Economic Council of uh, Pakistan has already approved that that project as has initiated. Uh, Initiated uh, in in, uh, in in July 2020, but 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 the implementation was was delayed because of, because of some of some of the management issues, some of the some of the preparations due to due to con uh, countrywide uh, uh, COVID situation. Uh, that that project will be will be will be uh, will be completed in in, in 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 three years, and and we have kept many things just to just to enhance our, our capacity. To, to cope with such kind of situation like 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 covid some of the major 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 pdos the project development objectives of, of that project are the are the are the to 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 mitigate the the negative social and economic impacts associated with the with the pest attacks like uh, like the like the locusts like the invasive species, species like, um, enhancing the capacity of the provincial plant protection departments uh, the agriculture departments to 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 uh, to handle such kind of situation, strengthening of the of the Ministry of National Food Security and Research, the Department of Plant Protection, to control the outbreaks, and strengthening of the the overall national food security information system in the in the country. This 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 was another another issue because we were we were not clearly clear were, were not clear about the availability of the of the uh, of the of the food food in the in the in the country and the and the future forecasts of of that. The government of China has supported us, us, us a lot. Uh, the FAO was uh, was uh, was one of the 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 major supporter to us uh, in the in the regional countries. The project will be will be comprising of the early warning, preparedness, and food se securities. That will be that 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 that, that will be an, an important component of that. We need to we need to establish uh, the the storage houses in in, in uh, uh, countries. The first strategy is to is to strengthen our strengths. And to and and the second strategy is to is to convert our vulnerability into into our sustainability. These are the two 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 major uh, uh, major major objectives. So the project activities will be will be comprising of the early warning preparedness and uh, and food security ensuring the food security livelihood protection and rehabilitation. This is an important surveillance and 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 and, and, and control measures, and 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 finally the the project management monitoring and e evaluation. So these are these are some areas uh, uh, which uh, uh, and the and the and the step take taken by the by the by the government of Pakistan. Uh, I believe uh, uh, my my message has 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 been reached to the to the to the other panelists and the attendees. If if there is any question, if, if they want any clarification, so 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 I'm open for that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Thank you for sharing those insights on the situation in Pakistan. 
um, which is very specific to your country, but I'm sure many of those challenges are also replicated um, elsewhere. Next, we have Moses Mwale, uh, Director of the Department of Agriculture in Zambia. He says the main focus of his department is disseminating agricultural, technical and other information to the farming communities, as well as providing technical services in irrigation, agricultural mechanisation, crop production and protection and food and nutrition. Mr. Mwale was previously director of the Zambia Agriculture Research Institute and has served on the National Food and Nutrition Commission Board. He'll be speaking today about the dual problems of hunger and obesity and how to design healthier food systems. Thank you, Mr. Mwale, welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I was given the topic, hunger and obesity, uh, designing a healthier system. And uh, thanks very much to Kabi for inviting us to this high level discussion. We are going to be discussing lessons learned on ensuring uh, food security for vulnerable sectors in the South-South context during the COVID-19 pandemic. So when we're designing, uh, when you look at the triple burden of malnutrition in Zambia, you're looking at um, undernutrition, which is being underweight or stunted in terms of um, low height for age or wasted, uh, low weight for age or 35% of children under five in Zambia stunted. And also when you're looking at micronutrient uh, deficiencies, um, what, like hidden hunger, you look at inadequate consumption of vitamins and, uh, and minerals, about 55% of women of reproductive age in Zambia are zinc deficient. But also you can be looking at uh, overweight um, uh, and obesity, which is uh, weight uh, higher than what is considered healthy for a given um, given height. And uh, obesity is on the rise in Zambia, and it is one of the risk factors for type 2 diabetes and other metabolic uh, diseases. So when we are looking at the healthier uh, food systems, we are talking about uh, the nutrition scenario for Zambia indicates a need for healthier uh, food systems. Uh, the joint sector work plan for nutrition and cross-cutting uh, technical and advisory services for the Minister of Agriculture and Minister of Fisheries and Livestock outlined four strategic objectives that are critical in the fight against hunger and obesity, as well as the attainment of healthy food systems in Zambia uh, through a multi-sectoral approach. I think we emphasize that. And sustainability of interventions is a risk component in the work plan. And this means that the interventions balance economic, social, and uh, environmental concerns. So in terms of uh, the strategies, uh, we have strategic objectives in the fight against hunger and obesity. Uh, strategic objective number one, uh, promote stable and sustainable availability of foods from the six uh, food groups which we consider to be the first one, vegetables, then fruits, beans, pulses, legumes, and nuts, uh, poultry, poultry, fish, insects, meats, meats and, uh, and meats, cereals and starchy foods, roots and tubers, as well as milk and milk products. So in terms of the first strategy, uh, we are looking at uh, increased production of a variety of crops, including cereals, tubers, vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, pulses, and biofortified the crops. We are looking at climate smart agriculture and environmentally friendly methods such as conservation agriculture being promoted by the Ministry of Agriculture. And strategy two, we are increasing production of variety of fish. Three, we are increasing production of variety of livestock, and we also reduce food losses. The Ministry of Agriculture trains small scale farmers in post harvest loss management and processing preservation and storage of foods. But then when you're looking at uh, strategic uh, objective number two, we look at improve access to adequate and appropriate food uh, in terms of quantity and, uh, and quality. So there are the first strategy, we are looking at uh, increased nutrition through improved livelihoods and the Ministry of Agriculture uh, promotes agriculture related income generating activities food processing and value addition. And the ministry also is implementing the uh, climate smart agricultural technologies, which uh, aims at uh, increasing farmers uh, uh, resilience and reducing vulnerabilities to climate change. And also we increase farmer households access to markets. 
Then when you look at strategic objective number three, we increase consumption of a variety of uh, nutrient rich foods from the different uh, food groups. There the strategy being to increase awareness and knowledge on nutrition. And actually the ministry has developed the Zambia food based dietary guidelines, which will be launched actually today and will serve as a key document to guide healthy food choices for the Zambian uh, population. Then we are looking at uh, uh, strategic objective number four. We are creating or strengthening an enabling environment for promoting food and nutrition sensitive programs. There we enhance capacity of staff to deliver nutrition sensitive programs. We strengthen M&E on nutrition sensitive agriculture and we increase resource mobilization and allocation to nutrient sensitive programs. And then we have to monitor and track these food uh, uh, security issues and uh, nutrition indicators. Uh, this is a vital component of ensuring food security, uh, not just for the vulnerable, but also for the country at large. And the National Food Balance Sheet, uh, this surveillance system has been undertaken since 1988. It's a critical monitoring tool of the food security in the country. Then when you look at uh, um, the National Food Balance Sheet, it consists of uh, elements, five elements, including availability, requirements, surplus deficit, potential commercial export and or food aid requirements. The steps followed when developing this uh, National Food Balance Sheet. First of all, we go through the crop focus survey to see what kind of production we envisage the stock monitoring and cross-border uh, trade, what is available. The data is collected, analyzed, and disseminated. And then we also use the national food balance sheet to, until recently, the food balance sheet captured limited list of crops, uh, disregarding other sources of food, such as livestock. And this gave a rise to a distorted picture of the nu nutrition security. As a result, the ministry has expanded the scope of the food balance sheet to include more crops, fisheries, and livestock. We also do vulnerability assessment. And this assessment is conducted annually by the Disaster Management and Mitigation Unit under the Vice President's Office. So in conclusion, uh, Chair, yeah, we are saying that it is important to fully implement strategies that promote food security while addressing all its key facets, which include availability, access, and utilization through a multi-sectoral approach. And also we are saying monitoring and tracking of food security and nutrition indicators is a vital component of ensuring food security, not just for the vulnerable, but also the country at large to enable a robust food system. I thank you and over. Thank you, Mr. Marley. Yes, important issues here. Um, and finally, let's um, move on to uh, Neil Wilshire, who is um, who joined CABI in August this year as Global Director for Value Chains and Trade. Neil has 25 years private sector experience setting up managing and transforming large scale international agribusiness value chains in tea, coffee, vegetables, herbs and flowers. He has worked in Africa for 15 years with a particular focus on inclusive smallholder models. His work in CABI is focused on creating inclusive, sustainable value chains, which can improve the livelihoods of smallholder farmers and help solve some of the problems the planet currently faces. And today he's going to share some insights on food value chains, infrastructure and mobility in times of pandemic. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, uh, thank you very much for the previous um, speakers. Um, uh, as was said right at the beginning, um, I think the first pre presenter said, uh, I'll, I'll focus on this area because there will be, there's likely to be a lot of repetition uh, throughout, which uh, in my view, fortunately, there was, and I make no apologies for uh, repeating many of the points made in my presentation, because I think they're all very, very um, <coughs> important. <coughs> as Ruth said, uh, my presentation is focusing, focus basically using my experience um, both um, uh, in the private sector and the work I've done in CABI um, um, to basically highlight issues. And I'll just take us through some basically uh, ones that we've, as I've said, we've already heard, but some macro issues focusing on a my, more micro level around uh, a, a typical agribusiness uh, value chain um, in um, the uh, focused, from my experience, uh, it's fairly African focused 
and then bring you back to some uh, thoughts around solutions and some final thoughts um, uh, on the bigger picture um, again. So first of all, uh, as we've heard before, you know, the, yes, it's the COVID pandemic, but uh, it's a food system shock. Um, it won't be the, it won't be, it isn't the first and it won't be the last. And, and I think we all know that these food system shocks um, are increasing. Um, we've got the fundamental uh, one planet uh, increasing population um, issue, global populations, and therefore their food uh, requirements are increasing. As a result of this, um, there's only one land bank and we've got huge pressure on land uh, is increasing. Uh, as the pressure on the land increases uh, and we need more and more food, the fresh, wa fresh water resource availability is becoming under increasing pressure uh, and we see more and more um, movement of uh, uh, people, uh, uh, countries uh, uh, looking to uh, access land to grow food um, uh, in further, fun, further flung places, therefore lengthening uh, supply chains. In the global south, we've got population growth. We see we're seeing huge uh, urbanization of mid, uh, mid and, and an increasing middle income uh, sector, which is increasing uh, food demand. Uh, and in the global north, we've got a population increase, so we've got again increased demand, uh, and we see uh, a focus uh, on the global north, uh, where its supply chains go into the global south, moving beyond uh, its established large scale um, suppliers to uh, feed out more uh, into the small older sector. Um, so there's a real uh, um, um, sort of increase in demand from all areas against, as I said, a backdrop of um, same amount of land. Uh, take the population and take climate change and um, it, it's no surprise why, you know, I said at the beginning that uh, this is a food shock. It's not the last. Um, it's not the first and it won't be the last and, and I think we all know that these have the potential to increase as we go forward putting pressure on food security um, livelihoods and nutrition. Taking a look at a, a sort of typical um, agribusiness uh, value chain uh, and the way things work, um, the flow of uh, services, information, capital and produce uh, and how these have been affected um, during the pan pandemic. If I start basically with volatile demand, and the volatile demand that we saw basically is, can be from an international uh, perspective, um, the whole change in uh, consumer habits uh, um, uh, in the short term in the international markets with restaurants closing, food service closing, and everyone then focusing back into um, uh, online Shopping caused uh, big changes in, in um, the demand for pro uh, products and produce. This was exasperated from an international export basis by the closure of much air freight, uh, airspace uh, and reduction in air freight. So product, perishable product could not even make its way to the market. Um, demand, volatile demand on a national basis. Uh, clearly we had um, initially, although it unwound itself as time went on, uh, basically lockdowns that were affecting uh, the flow of um, um, product uh, from uh, farm to market. Um, um, and I'll come on to that in a minute around, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the unlocking of those transport routes uh, and, and, and how that work uh, uh, transpired. I think then the last piece about clearly if we've got volatile demand, we had volatile price. Uh, we had, we saw huge price volatility, not only because of the supply and demand, but also because of the way that uh, in many um, uh, uh, areas uh, and, and uh, regions, um, because of the overall pandemic, we saw lowering income levels um, and lowering income levels led to lower demand uh, um, for, for food. Um, the second area within this really is really the, the effect on flow of goods and services. Um, so this was all around built uh, lo if we look locally around uh, initially around government regulation on lockdown and what could be transported where and what couldn't be transported and who could move and who couldn't move and within factories social distancing rules um, uh, isolation rules um, all had a, a detrimental effect effect um, um, on on the system clearly over time. Um, this basically uh, improved, 
as in many countries, we saw that, um, um, uh, for example, the agricultural sector, was it an essential service or wasn't an essential service? Could people go to work? Couldn't they go to work to begin with in many places? No, but then suddenly it was unlocked and people could get to work uh, and products started to flow again. I think uh, goods and flows and services, uh, the agribusiness sector in um, um, Africa, in Kenya in particular, a lot of its inputs are basically imported. So uh, FERTs imported, a lot of seeds are imported, um, a lot of the support services um, basically that are required around those are imported and basically had a lot of uh, congestion. Uh, within international freight, a congestion at ports, and as I said, uh, uh, regarding human travel, we, we really didn't have any uh, air, air, um, air for, um, a lot of the air corridors were closed. I think the other area around flows of goods and services uh, regarding lockdown, uh, people getting sick, being isolated, was availability of labor, and availability of labor not only to farm, but to aggregate, to supply the inputs, to drive the lorries, uh, and to work with processing centers. So again, a big effect um, on, on, on the overall system. Um, the third area, um, really a real, real big one, especially in, in the agribusiness sector in, in the Southern Hemisphere and, and really focusing on this whole, outside of the very large um, uh, organized organizations, um, the vast majority of, of agricultural product, as we know, comes from the smallholder sector and the potentially more disaggregated um, 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 uh, agribusiness value uh, supply chain. Um, and as we know, within this, the flow of capital and capital availability is hugely constrained. I mean, in, in Africa alone, basically, we're looking at uh, significant gaps of around, um, sorry, in the Southern Hemisphere, huge gaps within this of around 100 billion. Um, of financing. Um, as we know, investors see it as high risk um, and because of its small transaction size, they see it as high cost. Uh, and we know it's a, a, a big problem that's existed and it's a problem basically that, that really came to fore uh, within the pandemic because cash flow wasn't available. There was, no, there was no money sitting in the bank. There's no going to the bank for money because it was difficult before and, I, and it was difficult during. And, and the issue now is I think it's being, it will increase uh, the, the, the view of risk within agribusiness and small agribusiness and could well become more um, difficult going um, forward. I think the fourth area within this is really a, a flow of information. And I made the, the point there um, earlier about the fact that many of the more, the, the people who did, the organizations that did better within this um, or the cooperatives that did better than this are the ones that were organized end-to-end -end beforehand. Um, so they could access, uh, basically, understand um, public health requirements. They could understand uh, information flow access, and they could put the information flow right the way through their end-to-end -end value chain. Uh, they may have had their own transport fleets. They had access to clear market information, better inf information to because they were linked to the end market and better access to, um, uh, as I said, information around availability um, a pr a, and price. And, and also they were very much more aware of any support options that were available from either um, NGOs, from government, because they had ways of passing this information through their system. So I, I think within that, that, um, that, the, 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 although they did, do better. The problem there was when we start to these, talk to these slightly small, the smaller and what, what makes up the vast majority of the more disaggregated value chains, they didn't do um, as well. Um, so really short-term responses and building resilience, just a few thoughts here. Picking up on my last point there, I think a big one is, is and it, it, it comes out in what um, uh, my, my introductory is, introductory uh, part of, of my own background is, um, you, how, how do we take the learnings of some of those larger, the way that larger cooperatives, organizations manage to make these value chains work uh, by creating um, um, linkages through to the end market. Now, 
yes, maybe they are um, export oriented and they're linked to international markets, but why can't we make them work the same way by creating, doing, having more consolidation and cooperating through the value chain on a more local basis as well to reduce um, reduction, redu uh, reduce um, disruption. Um, I think the other thing is um, a lot of learnings, I'm sure, are on the ground in, a, in every single country is the need for um, rapid agile responses, which need to be coordinated at scale. Uh, so big, big learnings around communication, facilitation of information, um, regulation and, and action. Um, I, I'm sure there's not a single government or organization in the world that, that isn't, um, no, no, one, no one got this right. And I think some big learnings there around, um, as I said, the agility and speed of response and the way that every, it's coordinated. I think the other thought is really, uh, and it's been mentioned, is a real hard look at the shortening of supply chains. And this is not only around the disruption um, caused by COVID in supply chains, but the whole climate effect, the whole um, carbon emissions of sea freight, of air freight, um, um, and, the, and the, 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 what will be the continued fragility uh, and exposure of these long value chains. So shortening of supply chains to de-risk food shop um, and longer term supply, I think is a, um, going to be a, a, a real focal point. Uh, in, I suppose linked to that import substitution on a re regional basis, it's been brought up. So a real hard close look at, at growing more of the staples at home, um, producing more seed at home, producing more fertilizer at home. Now that's probably easier said than done for maybe some of these chemical fertilizers, but as we move and try to go to a more um, sustainable agribusiness uh, model and food system model, I think more focus on biofertilizers, regenerative agriculture is going to come from this. Um, biocontrol methods rather than chemical methods of fighting pests and disease uh, is another one. And, and all of those could be looked at, um, as I said, being uh, produced locally uh, to, re to remove uh, the risk of, of importation during um, supply chain uh, breakdowns. Um, I think overall, and I suppose it's a, all of the above, is a real focus on the increased development of sustainable, resilient, end-to-end -end food systems. And it is about end-to-end -end food systems. And obviously, the sustainable, resilient uh, refers to my last three points. The, third, uh, the first point is very, very much around that end-to-end -end food system. The last part of that end-to-end -end food system is very, very much around my strengthening linkages, learnings, consolidation, cooperation. Um, digital technology clearly did play a big part and will play a big part. Um, when we're talking about disaggregated, fragmented um, value chains in, in, in Africa, uh, in the, um, um, the, the South, um, involving all thousands and, uh, sorry, several million, hundreds of millions of people, I think it's all down to um, we've got to sure, make sure the basics are in place and it's about practical, pragmatic application um, of these. And they all, again, have to be link up and be consolidated and coordinated within the bigger picture. But clearly huge opportunities around e-commerce, um, virtual interventions and uh, information um, and data management. Uh, picking up again on, cap on capital and the importance of this and the, prob the, 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 well, the current problems that, that uh, are faced by the um, underserved middle um, within the ag ag uh, smallholder agribusiness value chain, um, improving cash flow is, is an absolute necessity, um, improving access to finance. Uh, and on the other side, there is the possibility and opportunity of potentially helping uh, widen income streams uh, of um, people um, of smallholder farmers, so they're not as exposed to just one um, um, income source. Um, finish this slide. Uh, I think a big focus um, on a more macro scale is um, clearly what came out um, and what I'm sure a lot of uh, uh, governments and organizations be looking at is, again, this immediate response, meeting the immediate needs of vulnerable populations, emergency um, relief, and, and Clearly, we've got 
incredible organizations around the world that all do that uh, all the time, but um, clearly their work is not, sadly, not going to get less, it's going to get more um, as we face more and more of these food shocks until we solve the problem. Um, prioritize and support value chain focused, value chains focused on food security um, through the development of resilient and inclusive local food systems. Um, again, picking up on a point around local um, versus imported um, and shortening supply chains, uh, value chains there. And that we need to take a global multi-sectoral approach to all of these things um, to make them work. One uh, final summary slide. Um, really probably re-emphasizing a couple of points I made earlier on. Um, COVID-19, yes, a short-term shock, but clearly with long-term consequences. I, I think the timing of COVID and the timing of all the um, ramp up of um, understanding, um, and I mean, true and deep understanding of climate change and, and where we are, um, I really do hope, I really do think is a huge wake up call to everyone. I, I think you know, there is, a, there will be, there has to be a change, it is a wake up call. And I think the things that come out of this is, we recognize that global problems demand global responses. Um, we've all got to learn to adapt and build resilience across all the, the food system. This risk has to be shared together. We've got to share knowledge and we've got to invest together for the future if we want to solve this. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for sharing those learnings and potential solutions. I'm very conscious. Unfortunately, we've um, we've run over um, quite considerably and uh, doesn't leave much time for questions. But um, as I said, thank you to the panelists for, for answering those that have been put in the q and I wonder if um, uh, one of the things that's occurred to me is, um, are there any countries or regions in particular that, um, that have been successful and that have handled the pandemic well in terms of protecting food security um, that, that could be handled, that could be held up as examples of good practice. Um, and uh, one of our attendees has asked um, to Professor Fan, can you share China's experience in how it dealt with the swine flu during the COVID pandemic and how it avoided the surge in prices? Um, so Professor Fan, perhaps you, you might combine those, those two questions. Oh, yes. Well, first, we, uh, the so-called Green Channels has played a very big role in ensuring smooth food supply. As you know, in the very beginning of the pandemic, roads were blocked, cities were blocked, and the whole supply chain were disrupted. Neighbors couldn't come to work. Uh, the fresh produce couldn't market it. So the, the government realized uh, this, this issue. So um, the government announced several emergent calls uh, uh, to make sure that no governments, no authorities will block the food supply trucks. Uh, that worked very well. So anything can wait, but not food, not medicine. And that was a key effort that the government has been doing. Well, on the supply side, that has been quite a successful, I think globally, uh, I'm a bit sort of a positive on that. But the problem is uh, the demand side because of lost income, lost jobs. Many people simply cannot afford healthy and nutritious food. That has been an issue for many people to, to watch. Now, on, on swine fever, African swine fever, uh, well, a couple of things. One is, the, I think to a large extent, maybe it's a it's, it's a policy failure, you know, how we can design better policy to ensure uh, the animals are protected, uh, to ensure that uh, the, the meat production is, is resilient. You know, it's not just a high concentrated hog farms. These are very vulnerable to shocks. That's one thing on the supply side, more resilient, maybe smallholder, maybe company plus smallholders, that model can be further explored. On the consumption side, actually, we learned a positive uh, lesson. Before the last two or three years, the Chinese uh, pork per capita consumption has declined quite a bit. 
but we are fine. <laughs> we have never experienced any problem, which means we could actually reduce the red meat consumption without causing any social health or any problem. So that gives me a positive confidence. We can actually change our diets, move our diets from red meat or animal-based to plant-based. Well, of course, some you know, high quality, sustainable animal proteins is still quite important. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Jerome, um, you raised your hand earlier. Was there something that you, uh, you would like to add? Yes, uh, thank you, Ruth. Uh, the answer to your last question or whether there are good practices, I think uh, invariably the evidence on the impact of uh, COVID-19 on food systems and agriculture are just beginning to emerge. So I think maybe in the next uh, one, two or three months, we can then say authoritatively that we have some uh, good practices. Uh, that is what I will say for now. There was a specific question in the chat box on uh, the perceived role of the tertiary institutions uh, that we did not really discuss them. Invariably, just like the overall response to the COVID pandemic, where universities and other higher institutions have played a major role, I think it's going to be the same in terms of food systems and agriculture generally. Whether you talk of the development of uh, vaccines and the role which Oxford University played in developing the AstraZeneca vaccine, or you think uh, what uh, John Hopkins uh, University has been able to do in terms of providing online uh, real-time uh, data on COVID uh, spread all over the world. So I do think that there is a major role for uh, uh, universities in moving forward. And um, actually, Professor uh, Jerome, while you're there, I was, um, this week we've had the Global Nutrition Report um, release, which paints a very bleak picture really about um, nutrition around the world um, in, the, in the wake of COVID. And it says that one of the key components of, of building back better is, um, uh, you know, must be financing for, um, for nutrition. Um, is this something that's being recognised? That's being recognised by governments in your in your region? And what what role could the private sector play in this? Uh, invariably, I mean, recognising the role of nutrition, both in COVID and everything. The Africa Union team of the year for 2022 is going to be on nutrition and uh, food security generally. So we're going to be doing a lot of work, including the private sector in taking nutrition forward. I think since we've only got a few minutes um, left, I'll, I'll have to just wrap up now with a final question, um, which is really just what one lesson would, would you all take from the COVID-19 pandemic to protect food systems in the event of further shocks? Who would like to start? Neil, perhaps. Yes, I'll start, but I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll just take one second to answer. There was one other question there, which was directed at me, mm. and it was about the shortening of supply chains um, and how this has happened in Europe and, and uh, learnings for and how it could be applied uh, elsewhere. In very, very, in, in, in brief, clearly over, if I talk the UK, over the past sort of, oh, I suppose, 10 years, there's been... There has been a huge move, whether it be if I just talk of vegetables and flowers of, of you know, buy local, buy local, buy local, um, stop the carbon footprint, let's not buy from overseas, let's make ourselves more um, self-sufficient. Um, so that, that we've seen that happen in Europe. And, and I, I truly believe that with the development in, in um, a, a, a lot of the, if I, if I just talk about um, Kenya, for example, the development of larger um, retail multiples and um, um, if we talk about development of larger retail multiples in, in, um, within um, uh, Kenya, th those have started to work where they are setting up end-to-end um, uh, -end value chains, supply chains um, that do give um, uh, sort of uh, smallholder farmers and farmers access to those in the same way. Uh, so you've got more of a, 
um, um, a resilient system uh, of supply and a more, more sure um, supply and demand model. It doesn't mean that it's not, again, um, uh, going to break down if, if there's a lockdown and product can't get to market. But I think my point there, the point there is a lot of those, part of the point they've been built up uh, and, and uh, is um, one of the advantages of those is really the piece, uh, and we haven't touched on it at all here, is safe food for all. So it's putting in a lot of uh, mechanisms around traceability and, and safe food, and also being able to control waste a, a, a lot more. Um, one further example on that, uh, Cabby has done quite a bit of work um, uh, in Zambia um, and looked very, very closely at uh, gain linking smallholder farmers um, to retail, to large retailers there. Uh, and it was very, very much focused about, you know, you bring all this food in, why are we not buying it locally? And it was very much about putting rules, regulations in about safe food for all. Um, my one point that I would make is, well, sadly, there's two. One, one was basically, let the, let, how do we let the micro disaggregated uh, institutions uh, learn from, learn from the larger aggregated organizations, the ones that did better. How do we share that knowledge across it? And then the last one, which was a, 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 a bullet, not a bullet point, but it was a little box on one of my slides, uh, the, was and one thing we didn't, if there's one thing I could solve today or with a magic wand, it would be waste. The amount, criminal amount of waste that goes on basically in the value chain at source and then criminally at the other end, that uh, in a lot of markets, it gets to market and is then thrown away. I, I think waste for me is a, a huge, huge thing that, that, you know, when we're talking 40% and some of the numbers we talk about, about increasing production and other things come nowhere near that. If we could stop, reduce the 40% waste, we need 40% less land. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Um, Marley, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, please. I think from our side, uh, we emphasize a multi-sectoral approach. I think the challenges are many. Um, from our side, we have to look at increasing production and productivity. And in so doing, we have to look at issues of uh, irrigation and uh, mechanization. But once that um, uh, production is increased, then we also have to look at issues of processing and value addition so that we develop small and medium enterprises as they develop the, the food systems. A multi-sector approach is important because we have to tap into each other's complementarities and strength so that we move together as we develop the robust food systems. Thank you. I think we are facing a lot of challenges that across different ministries, agriculture, food, nutrition, health, environment, climate change, but right now, we don't have um, mechanisms at national level or local level to coordinate all this together. Very often, they work against each other. Um, the, the goals, for example, agriculture wants to produce more food, uh, environment wants to protect the uh, animals, the uh, forestry, uh, and biodiversity, and health wanted to, you know, to spend more money on medical services. So I think food can bring all this together, but we don't have a mechanism to coordinate it together. To me, this is a key issue. We all fail at global level, national level, and local level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ruth, with your, uh, with your permission, let me to add, uh, I think in the, in the uh, if we divide the, uh, the, the, uh, the pandemic era, Initially, initially, it was really difficult time. It was it was really challenging, but but later on, I think I think more opportunities have been created at, at, at the moment. Even even the uh, the online transactions, even the uh, the the digital trade that has been 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 evolved. Uh, so, uh, especially for a country like uh, like Pakistan, which is a developing country, which is still uh, still st uh, struggling with many many of the things. I think uh, the food supply, the, 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 the other activities, uh, the online online uh, delivery system that has been established, uh, and even even as far as uh, the, the it's, it's a desire of the government to, to make the, the economy documented. So, so through online transactions to, to, to use of uh, the, uh, the plastic money, 
So this is, these are also also some of the, I think we should be, we should be optimistic about such kind of uh, things. And, 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 and a lot of lessons are, have been learned by, by, by very various countries, by various government. Uh, and uh, I think, I think uh, we should be, we should be optimistic in, in future. Uh, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, lessons are, are, are there during, during this, this period. And still, still the, the pandemic is, is there. It's, it's not over. We, we, should, we should be very, very much vigilant. Thank you. Well, that's uh, perhaps a good positive note to end on. Um, I'd thank, like to thank all our panellists for joining us today. Thank you so much for sharing your, your thoughts and insights. Um, and um, perhaps, Daniel, would you like to make just a, a few short closing remarks? Yes, just no, really just to echo what you said, Ruth. And as I just uh, indicated on the chat, I'd just like to thank our panellists for their uh, excellent presentations. Uh, and useful and interesting additional comments and um, thank you everybody for uh, your attention thank you then everyone thank you for joining us thank you to everyone um, all the audience um, for your questions as well